So after some pacing or walking, you want to do japa or meditation, and one complaint that you may have is, I want to meditate before going to bed, but I am so tired. Watch out! That tiredness could be not because of the work you did, but quite possibly because of certain extra talking you did, even on phone it could be, where the something could have been narrated in five sentences, you opened what they call whole Ramayana. <laughs> Sometimes the person at the other end says, thank you, thank you, you don't have to tell me that whole Ramayana now, you know, Ramayana, Mahabharata and so on. In fact, all of us realize it, to be frank with you, people like me, speakers on religious texts, sometimes audience may not recognize. We get down from the platform with a tinge of regret. I think I explained something too elaborately, more than necessary, and so on. That leaves behind a certain agitation, certain dissatisfaction. Therefore, whether on a platform like this, or in a business transaction, no matter where, not that we must be like machines, always being careful about energy conservation, being very human, we must at the same time be alert, not to waste energy in ex excessive speaking. So, without going long on it, yesterday, to give a quick summary, Raja Yoga consisted in conserving energy, calming the mind by breath regulation, and then that calm mind, that quietened mind, has to be engaged in contemplation on the Supreme Truth. What is implied is you should listen to some Vedanta and get to know what that Supreme Truth is. Otherwise, how can you contemplate on something about which you have no idea? But when you are ready, like they say, when the flower blossoms, a bee would come. When you are ready, necessary instruction about the transcendental truth will come to you. But do you have the energy to hold it? Do you have the capacity to keep it on your palm or do you let it go slip through the fingers? In order that you may bear that truth in your consciousness, this calm mind is necessary. Therefore, there was a shloka, prana bandhanat leena manasam eka chintanat nasha metyadaha. The mind made relatively quiet by breath observation is transcended. The ego in it is destroyed by contemplation upon the highest spiritual truth. Now we take up today, starting with the seventeenth shloka. Let me tell you, of all the thirty shlokas, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen and twenty, the four that we are going to study this afternoon, this Saturday, nineteenth <coughs> October, are the crux of this entire Upadesha Sara. What is more, these four verses represent that path, that discipline, that spiritual exercise of which Maharshi Ramana was the champion. While he endorsed, accommodated, encouraged, approved, call at you as you may, all the paths, he was a highly accommodative teacher. I have been in my life touched by two great masters. After I got foundational wisdom from Swami Chinmayananda, in my own personal journey, after foundation was supplied to me by Swami, Swami Chinmayananda, he, he was my living guru. I was deeply touched by Maharshi Ramana 
Then somehow something unexpected happened. I was very profoundly touched by J. Krishnamurti, who is regarded as an idol breaker, not breaker of those physical idols, stone, etc. Idol philosophically can stand for concept, concept of God, concept of Guru, concept of an authoritative scripture, or why? Concept of marriage, concept of educational institution, concept of court, supreme court, etc. Human life is full of various concepts, various institutions, various structures, which collectively you and I respect. And we presume that these structures, the institution of marriage, the institution of parenthood, the institutions called schools and colleges, and in religion, scriptures, God, Guru, etc. All these are believed by the human mind, collectively sometimes, millions believe that this is the book which has answers to everybody, right? Krishnamurti questioned, questioned, challenged them with so much force, so much logic that many people kept a distance from him. In many Hindu ashrams, maybe in other ashrams too, J. Krishnamurti's books are banned. In fact, in the Chinmaya ashram, where I got my basic training, a two-year residential program, Swami Chinmayaranji was very broad-minded. At the same time, he was a disciplinarian. He, in fact, had a wonderful solution to this, call it, problem of J. Krishnamurti. Somebody asked him, can we read J. Krishnamurti? He said, during the two years of our training program, don't touch J. Krishnamurti's books. After we train you, give you a good foundation of Vedanta, touch any book under the sun. So he had a concept of you know, not getting dissipated. Like the analogy is given, when a plant is tender, you need an enclosure. That is the analogy. J. Krishnamurti would question that also. When the plant later becomes tall and a strong tree, the very same cows or other animals which might have damaged the plant in its tenderness or young youth would come and take shade, you know, take shelter under the tree. Anyway, I want to conclude that thought which came to me. Ramana Maharshi was an inclusive teacher. A devotee goes, a social servant goes, social worker, or a great scholar goes, a Christian goes, a Muslim goes. Maharshi would listen to their idea of spiritual practice and would say, very good, keep doing that. Eventually you will come to self-inquiry. That is coming up now. <laughs> Where J. Krishnamurti was highly exclusive. Therefore, idol breaker, and there is a Greek word for it which is included in the English language, iconoclast. Icon is an idol. Clast is destroyer. He was an iconoclastic, radical, revolutionary thinker. And he very deeply you know, points out the same truth of our being actually a certain intelligence. The moment you and I take ourselves to be Hindu, man, old, scholarly, belonging to this group, political, religious, and so on and so forth, for a little benefit and a little sense of security in that identity, we also run into a lot of trouble. When we are with the people of the same identity, we feel very good. We say, oh, you also speak that language, I also speak that language. You believe in Ram, my Ishtadevata also is Ram. Oh, you, you are a vegan, I am also a vegan, etc., etc. But the human mind is in, you know, is in trouble when you are in 
You are a minority somewhere. All others believe in some other form of worship, some other form of food habit. All others speak some other language. You are likely to feel fish out of water. So people like Krishnamurti said, could you question any encrustation, any kind of crystallization of identity? And primarily, can you remain watchful? Don't embrace any identity too tightly. This is my way of putting it. Otherwise, he was used to be ruthless. He would say, don't have identity at all. <laughs> that is rather difficult. You and I need an identity. So, my own understanding, which tries to harmonize Krishna Murti with the traditional teachings, is it boils down to be a Hindu if you are, be a man, be a citizen of some country, be a follower of some language, etc., and be happy about the richness of those cultures. But hold all that together, hold that identity lightly in your consciousness. Do not become a fanatic. Do not look at another language, another culture to be inferior and so on. At least don't hastily come, jump to a conclusion. Coming back now, this identity, I don't regret having talked a little in detail about it, is that identity is crucial in what we are going to discuss now the psychological identity. Physical identity is a fact. If somebody says, you know, I am below 40 and there are seven of us who are below 40 here, that age, sometime back I came to know there is an award in this country which is called 35 under 35. Have you heard about it? A girl, uh, a, a girl in San Jose uh, got that award. Uh, that's how I came to know. She was our Balvihar child before. Now she is a scientist, PhD from Stanford University. She got that award, 35 under 35, some two years ago. What is that? 35 super achievers in the United States who are under the age of 35. They select 35 people who are under the age of 35. So this girl, Hamsa Venkatesh, won that prize. She has done some advanced research in cancer biology, right? So if you have that identity, you know, it is factual. You know, you are below 35. But other kinds of judgments, which are in the psychological domain, are the target of the self-inquiry. So introducing this path of Atma Vichara, self-inquiry, I would say Mahashi Ramana makes a very, very mind-blowing statement. Take a look at the 17th verse. He says in Shloka 17, Manasam tu kim margane krite Manasam tu kim margane krite Naiva manasam marga arjavat Naiva manasam marga arjavat Manasam tu kim margane krite Manasam tu kim margane krite Naiva manasam marga arjavat Naiva manasam marga arjavat Manasam tu kim This tu, manasam tu Tu is just to indicate a change of topic The previous six verses were giving us an outline of Raja Yoga and changing the topic getting into Jnana Yoga, of which a variation is Vichara Marga, inquiry, questioning. The word Tu is introduced. Otherwise the question is Manasam Kim. What does Manasam Kim mean? Manasa is a synonym for Manaha. They are of the same meaning. 
मनह किम यू एंड आई ऑन ओकेजन्स फील आई हैव एवरीथिंग बट नो पीस ऑफ माइंड मोस्ट ऑफ अस आफ्टर वी अचीव समथिंग वी हैव मनी वी हैव पावर वी हैव अ गुड स्टैंडर्ड ऑफ लिविंग बट स्ट्रेस और लोनलीनेस और ए सर्टन हर्ट that someone so close to us somebody for whom we did so much has let us down has moved away from us all kinds of you know mental suffering are part of human life now where do they take place all these worries where does suffering take place in what is called the mind peace of mind what is this mind manasam kim and i request you to see the last part of the shloka uh, so not last third part he says if you really question you go to the depth of it naiva manasam the third quarter see each shloka has four quarters we call them pada manasam dukhin first pada margane krite second pada naiva manasam third 